Join me in the call to confession. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in Him, we dare to approach God in confidence. Confident in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God, the clean been glorified in him, God will all 
also glorify the human one in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will look for me. But just as I told the Jewish leaders, I also tell you now, where I'm going, you can't come. I give you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love each other. And this week's reading from the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. The apostles and the brothers and sisters throughout Judea heard that even Gentiles had welcomed God's word. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. They accused him, you went into the home of the uncircumcised and ate with them. Step by step. Peter explained what had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying when I had a visionary experience. In my vision, I saw something like a large linen sheet being lowered from heaven by its four corners. It came all the way down to me. As I stared at it, wondering what it was, I saw four-legged animals including wild beasts, as well as reptiles and wild birds. I heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I responded, absolutely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice from heaven spoke a second time. Never consider unclean what God has made pure. This happened three times, then everything was pulled back into heaven. At that moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were staying. The Spirit told me to go with them, even though they were Gentiles. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered that man's house. He reported to us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and summon Simon, who is known as Peter. He will tell you how you and your entire household can be saved. When I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as the Spirit fell on us in the beginning. I remembered the Lord's words. John had baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then who am I? Could I stand in God's way? Once the apostles and other believers heard this, they calmed down. They praised God and concluded, so then God has enabled Gentiles to change their hearts and lives so that they might have new life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I was recently watching a garden show on TV, which sounds like I only watch one, but of the many garden shows I've recently watched, one of them was one of those shows where there's a homeowner and two different people present an idea for the garden. It was a British show, so it wasn't a yard, it was a garden. After they find out about the homeowner and their needs and their budget, they make two different designs and the homeowner has to choose one. On this particular episode, the homeowner chose the design I would have chosen. That doesn't always happen. The design was warm and green and had plenty of habitat and landing spots for birds and bees and insects and flowers that were the perfect subject for the homeowner's interest in macro photography. The homeowner had a pretty good sized budget, particularly for the size of the garden or backyard. So the show documented fairly dramatic changes. They cut down a giant, overgrown conifer in the corner. They dug out a pond in the yard. They planted uh, espalier fruit trees so that there were fruit trees. They welded together three steel raised beds for the homeowner's vegetable patch. And then, time for the big reveal. They walked her into her backyard, her eyes shut, and gave her the open your eyes on three countdown. And she did. She opened her eyes on three. Her mouth said, oh wow. But her face said, this is it. To be honest, my mouth said, that's it. What had been a warm green design on the artist's rendering was, in fact, a bright, shadeless backyard. There were a couple of trees that had been left, trees planted right along her, the brick wall that enclosed the garden, but there was nothing of that gorgeous, deep, lush green of the design drawing. They were now bright grass green. The plants were small, and of course I know the plants are usually small. They take time to grow in. But all in all, I looked at it and thought, hmm, I would have thought that much money would have gone farther. The end result wasn't at all how I had pictured it. And isn't that often the case? We picture something in our heads, and then we see it in reality, and it isn't at all what we pictured. Have you seen Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa in person? Meh. It's about this big. And there are people 20 feet deep. Or maybe the Alamo. Have you been to the Alamo? And you see pictures of the Alamo, and then you get to the Alamo, and oh. Van Gogh's Starry Night, same thing. It's smaller than I thought it would be. Sometimes things are different than the way we imagine them. And sometimes they're different even when we have a picture. I have a picture that I, of the Great Pyramids in Egypt that I've used in classes that I've taught. I shot it out of a book, so obviously this was pre-internet when you had to shoot pictures out of a book. But I showed it in a humanities survey class I was teaching, and one of the students said, how did you get a shot without the skyline and the traffic? Really? Traffic? I thought the pyramids were out in the middle of the desert. But like the Alamo, I guess, things grow up around old things. Well, there are any number of jokes and country songs about what it will be like in heaven but I bet whatever it is, you've imagined it. And I like the things we read in Revelation. No pain, no death, no tears, no crying, no mourning. In another part of that text, we read that there's no need for lamp or sun because Jesus illuminates everything. That all sounds really good to me. 
streets of gold, well, I can take or leave those because in heaven I need to be able to go barefoot. And I'm sure a street of gold is going to be very warm with the constant shining presence of the Lord. But can you imagine the shock as the early Christians are sitting around talking about heaven, all they have known about heaven from their tradition, all they have imagined, all they have read in scripture, and all of a sudden Peter says, hey, did you know there's gonna be pulled pork in heaven? <laughs> We're gonna be eating shrimp too. And you'll be sitting next to uncircumcised Gentiles while you do it. I can imagine their mouths would have said, wow. And their faces would have said, is there what? That probably isn't at all how they pictured it. The story in Acts is a pivotal point in the fledgling Christian church's history. It answers the question, what does it mean to be a Christian? Must one be like Christ? a Jew before one can be a Christian. Is the path to Christ through the practices of the Jewish religion? Many of the early Christians said absolutely it is. Perhaps because that's the path they took to Jesus. And so they believe that it is the best way and should be the only way that someone can be a Christian. The people who knew Jesus, and keep in mind we're getting more and more historically removed from Jesus, so fewer and fewer of those folks are still active in churches. They knew Jesus through his words and his actions. They knew him through his visits to the synagogue and his observance of the Passover and all the things related to his Jewish faith. And if those closest to Jesus knew him in that way, then surely it would be best if everyone knew him that way. But here comes Peter with a different idea. And how many times does that happen in Scripture? Peter does something outrageous, like jumping out of a boat to walk on water. Peter does something outrageous, and the path of the faithful takes a little, or in this case, a huge turn. In this case, it happens with some unusual trappings. There's a trance or a vision, there's a spirit, there's an angel. It's the vision that really puts Peter and the church between the old purity requirements and God's new verdict on what is clean. The purity requirements are quite detailed. In Deuteronomy 14, 3 through 20, and Le Leviticus 11, 2 through 28, they are outlined in great detail. So here's a sampling. If you, if you haven't read Leviticus lately, you should do it. Here is the sampling. Speak to the people of Israel, saying, From among all the land animals, these are the creatures you may eat. Any animal that has divided hooves and is cleft-footed and chews the cud, such you may eat. But among those that chew the cud or have divided hooves, you shall not eat the following. The camel, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hooves. The hare, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hoofs. The pig, for even though it has divided hoofs and is cleft-footed, it does not chew the cud. Of their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. These you may eat of all that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or the streams, you may eat. But anything in the seas or streams that does not have fins and scales of the swarming creatures in the waters and among all the other living creatures, they are detestable to you. And detestable they shall remain. Everything that does not have fins or scales is detestable to you. These you shall regard as detestable among the birds. They shall not be eaten. 
They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the osprey, the buzzard, every raven of any kind, the ostrich, the seagull, the hawk of any kind, the little owl, the great owl, the water hen, the desert owl, the stork, the heron, the bat. It goes on. Which kind of winged insects can we eat and which can we not eat? It has to do with where their legs are joined, actually. All of this is very clear. There's no misunderstanding what these texts say. And though we have foods, lists of foods that we like and dislike, we don't really need to feel that superior to our ancient brothers and sisters because we have our, also have our own lists of who and what is clean or unclean. There's much talk in some Christian circles about what it means to be pure. What does that mean? And how does the church treat those who, in their estimation, are not pure? And so Peter's vision is followed by a meeting in which Peter sees the Holy Spirit fall on them. Gentiles, just as it had fallen on us, the apostles at Pentecost. And so Peter asks in verse 17, if then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed the Lord Jesus Christ, who am I that I should hinder God? Who are we to hinder a new thing that God is doing? Who are we to make declarations about clean and unclean? Who are we to set up distinctions and divisions? Certainly there may be distinctions and divisions. But aren't those for God to say? What God has made clean, you must not call unclean. It's a new idea, much like Jesus' new commandment, that we love one another as Christ has loved us. Our job is to practice that here on earth to practice in what we do and what we say, in how we label or don't label people, in who we consider in and who we consider out, in who we sit with at the communion table. Such a call is a challenge. And for some people, it's also very threatening. It certainly seems different than the attitudes and practices of some churches, which seem to thrive on separation and division and voting people off the island. It may be hard. It may seem threatening. But it's also the gospel as we read it. And so we come to a time of practice we will gather at Christ's table, and then we will gather at tables outside. Look around you today at those who are seated, sharing this banquet with you. Think of those people around the world who gather today in different places, in buildings that look like this one, in huts with mud walls or no walls at all people whose skin looks like yours, and people whose skin is different, people whose eyes are the shape and color of yours, and people whose eyes have different shapes and different colors, people who speak languages you know 
and those who speak languages you do not know. People who worship like you do. And people whose worship is completely alien to you. Think of all of that. Practice all of that. So that when we sit one day at the heavenly banquet and look around at those seated near us, all of us invited by Jesus Christ, our host, in that moment we can say, this is just how I pictured it. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
tells us that people will come from north and south and east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. And so we are here at God's table. This is not a Presbyterian table. Jesus Christ is your host as he is mine. And he invites all of those who are weary, who are carrying heavy burdens, to come and be sustained at this table. We begin our meal with thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. The sun and moon and shining stars praise your name. The fish of the deep, the creatures of the earth, and the birds of the air glorify you. All people, young and old, give thanks, for you are our salvation. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Though Christ has ascended to reign with you in glory, he left us this commandment, to love one another as he loves us. By this love, the world will know that we are his disciples. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with your church in all the world. O oh God, as we are touched by the light of this new day, we remember that every Sunday is an Easter Sunday. Our hearts are warmed by our prayers and praises, and we come before you to pray for the needs of our world. Into the light of this Easter morning, we raise those who are struggling with illness, with despair over their lives, or with the breakdown of relationships. May the light of Christ shine upon them. Into the light of this Easter morning, we bring those places in our world where war, violence, poverty, and need are the experiences of everyday life. May the light of Christ shine upon them. Into the light of this Easter morning, we bring the headline news of this week. We hold in our hearts the pain of those suffering violence, bereavement, or conflict. May the light of Christ shine on them. And into the light of this Easter morning, we bring ourselves the private struggles, the heart's yearnings, the hidden dreams, the unfulfilled potential. May the light of Christ shine upon us. Make a home among us. Let us be your people as you are our God. Show us a glimpse of your new creation, your new heaven and earth. And let us drink from the wellspring of everlasting life. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And we pray the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And in the same manner he took the cup, 
and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink all you of it. Friends, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And he will come. But until then, he offers us these, the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray together. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Even more, we thank you that our future is in your hands. You know the plans you have for Fondren, plans for a future with hope. So we call upon you now, Lord, as we enter this meeting to silence in us any voice but your own. May the words we say be the words you would say. May the love we have for this place and these people be the love you have for us. We seek your will, God of our past, present, and future. And we wait and watch for the movement of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mr. Clerk, is there a quorum? Yes, Madam Moderator, there is a quorum. We are gathered to elect members of the Pastor Nominating Committee, and I will call on Jane Sanders, who chaired the Congregational Nominating Committee, for her report. Congregational Nominating Committee is chosen annually by the session and consists of two session members, one of whom will serve as the committee of the chair, and three at-large members of the congregation. It is the charge of the Nominating Committee to find three persons who will serve as session elders. We presented those candidates to you on Mark, um, excuse me, on April 24th. If a vacancy in the position of the installed pastor occurs during the year the nominating committee serves, it becomes the committee's charge from the session to elect members of the congregation to serve as the pastor nominating committee. The denomination recommends the following characteristics for people to serve on the pastor nominating committee. Knowledgeable about the church and community, spiritual leaders within the congregation who are active in the life and work of the congregation, able to make a significant commitment of their time, energy, and wisdom, willing to accept this as a task of spiritual discernment, not being easily influenced by personal desires or congregational politics. Today, on behalf of the nominating committee, I am presenting to you the five candidates we have selected, and I would ask them to stand as their names are called. Lisa Brown. She's out of town today. She had business. Yes. Ann Marshall. Beverly Ray. Stanton Wilkerson. And Jay Woods. These are the five nominees that the nominating committee is presenting for your consideration. As those come from the committee, they do not need a second. Are there nominations from the floor? Yes, I'd like to nominate a man tutor. Have you secured her permission? Yes. And do you wish for this to be a sixth person on the committee? or to put her name in the pool from which five will be chosen. Additional. Sixth additional person on the committee. Amanda Tudor, will you stand so folks can see who you are? Thank you. Are there other nominations from the floor? Is there a motion that we close nominations? Are you ready? You are ready to vote. I think we can do this by acclamation, Mr. Clark. Show of hands. Show. 
we shall by acclamation then. The six names before you to serve as the pastor nominating committee are Lisa Brown, Ann Marshall, Beverly Ray, Stan Wilkerson, you want Jay Woods, I'm sorry, from that corner, and Amanda Tudor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no. So ordered. <laughs> If we could, if the five, those of you who are here would come and stand down front, let us have um, a moment of prayer for you. And uh, that being our only business, I would entertain a motion that the meeting will be closed with the amen of the prayer. So moved. Is there a second? All those in favor, join me in prayer, please. If you'll face the congregation, these are your, these are your people. These are your people. Let us pray. Almighty God, we step into the future knowing you will be there to meet us even as you journey with us on the way. We thank you for these fond members who have agreed to serve as the pastor nominating committee. Give them direction, guidance, and faithfulness that they may not grow weary in this task. Give them diligence in their work and respect for one another. Give them open minds and open hearts as they talk among themselves and as they listen to the hopes and dreams of Fondren's members. Give them clarity to deal openly and truthfully with the realities of Fondren Presbyterian Church. Give them perception to recognize the one you have chosen to be Fondren's next installed pastor. We pray for the families of these PNC members who will be giving up time with their loved ones in the coming months. We pray for strength for those family members who may need to assume additional responsibilities during this time. We pray that they will have respect for the confidentiality of the process. As a congregation of God, may we fully support not just the PNC members, but their family as well. We pray for this congregation. We pray for patience with the process of God. When it seems like nothing is happening, when there are no fast answers to questions, remind us that your spirit is always at work, making the timing right for both pastor and congregation. Keep each bond member faithful in attendance and support of the congregation now. May we not fall into the trap of waiting for the new pastor. We are the church right now, O oh God. Inspire each member and friend of Fondren to fully participate in the process of assessing who Fondren is now and who you are calling Fondren to be. We pray for Fondren's next pastor. You already know who that is, all-knowing God. You know what will transpire here in Jackson and wherever that pastor might be to bring that pastor to Fondren. We pray that our steps toward that moment will be faithful, that we will be listening for your voice and watching for your signs. We pray that we will not seek to impose our own will, but that it is your will that is done. We look forward with joyful anticipation to that time, and we dedicate ourselves to this season of discernment. May you always find us faithful, loving God. We offer this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. A reminder that I will, we will do the charge and benediction and awaiting you outdoors is a feast. And then awaiting you after lunch is the feast in the fellowship hall of looking at um, how, how Fondren as a congregation may shape our buildings so that our building may thereafter shape us. Let us stand and be dismissed. We have sung it and we have prayed it and we have said it that they will know we are Christians by our love. All that remains is to go and live it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord's countenance be lifted up upon you and give you peace, now and forever.